Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. And of course, this, this being Australia Day is why my title is Great People Make a Great Nation. But of course, great people make a great church. A church is not great because of its brand or, you, you know what I'm saying, or its promotional machine or it's, it's um, having a few really effective programs or something. A church is great because it has great people. And obviously I'm not discounting a great God, but you hear, hear what I'm saying this morning. A church is great because it's full of great people and um, a nation is great according to the greatness of its people. Here in Genesis 12... Uh, verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And here's where I really want to get. I will make you a great nation. What an incredible blessing. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow, imagine being Abraham and having God speak that over your life. Isn't that incredible? But here's the thing, we are the seed of Abraham. You see, God wasn't just talking about a physical nation. And of course, we know that the Jews as a, as a nation or as a people, you know, have... Um, you know, they, they had a, a long period of time in their promised land. Then they were dispersed. And, of course, they ended up in every part of the world. And, um, but back in 1948, of course, the nation of Israel was formally reestablished again. And, um, uh, you know, and they consider themselves to be the sons and daughters of Abraham. But we read in the New Testament that because we are sons and daughters of the living God, we are also the spiritual seed of Abraham. And do you know what? This promise over Abraham is ours. Not only is the, what I shared earlier in the service about what De Kiros prophesied over Australia and surrounding lands in 1606, not only are we blessed because of that, but there is a greater blessing than that, and it is the blessing of being the seed of Abraham. And God said to him, I'll make you a great nation. Now here's the thing, they're not the biggest nation in the world, but they are one of the most influential nations in the world. They are also one of the most prosperous nations in the world. They are one of the most powerful nations if you look at the, the power that Jewish people have around the world. You know, there's a lot of people who actually still are anti-Semitic because the Jews control much of the money in the world. Well, God promised them that they would. <laughs> so go talk to God about it if you've got a problem with that. <laughs> Because that's the reality. God promised them that they would. That they would be a great nation. And that their name would be great. And that, they, and that they would be a blessing. Well, they are a blessing. They are. The Jewish people are a blessing to this planet that we live on. And he says, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. Wow. Guess what? If we're the spiritual seed of Abraham, this is ours. That we, as the kingdom of God, are a great nation. We are blessed. We have a great name. Even though people might say negative things about the church and even about Jesus and so on. And, um, but you know what? The, the bottom line is that at the name of Jesus, the devils tremble. We have a great name that we're under, that's written upon our lives. Amen? And not only that, but that this is all so that we can be a blessing. Fantastic, hey? And so that the, the families of the earth will be blessed through us. Do you know, um, the response from the people in India to Les and the team going in there and doing what they did in the middle of last year just continues on. Why? Because we are a part of a great nation slash kingdom slash church because... There are great people in this house and the reason there are is because we have a great God and we're surrendered to him and, and we're allowing him to raise us up and to, you know, to go from glory to glory into the image of God and, and because of his greatness in and through us, that does make us great people and as a result, the families of the earth are being blessed out of this house. That's awesome. It's not the biggest church in the world, but it has great influence. Yeah, absolutely. And so I want to talk about 
if great people make a great nation and great people make a great church, then um, what sort of people are they? And I want to talk to you about five kinds of people that I believe are in this house, but who I believe also are going to rise up in this next season. Amen? So can we go to slide num uh, next slide, thanks. All right, firstly is pioneers. Now this picture on here is a picture of uh, Burke and Wills, who, went, who traversed this continent from the Southern Ocean to the Northern Ocean in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And these guys were the first ones to do it, as far as I know. Talk about pioneers. There was no, no GAN railway then. <laughs> there were no you know, cattle stations or sheep stations or anything like that along the way back then. There were Aboriginal tribes and there was you know, trees and there was deserts and, you know, and all kinds of things, but there was nothing really that we know of today that's been developed since that time. These guys were pioneers. They were explorers. They, you know, and the first explorer really, that, that, um, or the one who's, who's mostly talked about is the one I talked about earlier today, De Kiros, who was exploring this southern part of the ocean, of the Pacific Ocean, on behalf of the King of Spain. And, um, and he found our country and then people like Burke and Wills and so many others, they opened the country up and, and they went out and they explored it in order for it to be pioneered and so that a new future could be pioneered for this nation. We also have pioneers who are discoverers of scientific and medical breakthroughs. Do you know that our nation, for our size, is pro rata number one in the world by a long way in the area of scientific and medical breakthroughs? That's a, that's a fact. Pro rata, we are number one by a long stretch. Why is that? It's because we're a blessed nation. It was prophesied in 1606, and there is a pioneering spirit is still in this nation. And people are still pioneering scientific things and medical things and so on that are being a blessing to the world. Isn't that incredible? Innovators in business, mining and industry. Do you know, this, this nation of Australia is full of such great people. Why? Because there is still a pioneering spirit in this nation. And you know what? This church has got a pioneering spirit in it. And it's not because of the leader, it's because it's part of being an apostolic church. It's part of, being, of what the kingdom of God is about. Because this kingdom, not only will it never end, but its, its increase will never end. In other words, this kingdom will always be on a pioneering footing, if you will. There'll be always somebody in the kingdom of God exploring new things in God, exploring new ways to reach people for Jesus, exploring new, new ideas as to how we can be more effective, you know, in, in, uh, in being the kind of church we're called to be and so on. Um, here at Acts Church, there are pioneers who are discovering new things in God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is enlightening their minds and their understandings. Amen? And uh, I want to encourage you, Maintain this pioneering spirit. Maintain a pioneering spirit. Do you know, um, Paul and the team said the other day, you know, we're not going to be in caretaker mode. I loved it. I just, something in my, inside me just leapt. Because you know why? Our past concepts, as I said earlier, of leadership and so on, can actually cause us to sit back and go, well, I wonder what's going to happen now. And guess what? The pioneers will get frustrated. And the pioneering spirit in the house will get quenched. But for Paul and the team to say, we're not going to be caretakers. We are going to continue the momentum. We're going to continue to progress on the basis of what has been to go towards what's going to be. And it's that pioneering spirit that does that, that says, hey, there's change. There's, there's a, a different phase coming up. But there's something inside all of us in the kingdom of God that says, hey, we can break new ground. We can explore something new here. We can uncover something powerful and new in God. We can break through into something that's innovative. We can see God do something great in this time. Amen? It's a pioneering spirit. All right, number two. Well, the next slide it actually is. Settlers. Do you know, after pioneers and explorers in our nation, there came settlers. And, um, you know, it's interesting that there is a chain of, of retail shops now called Early Settlers. And, of course, they, they carry a lot of um, products that are, you know, supposedly from the early days or in style of the early days of, of our nation. 
But you know what? It's amazing when you travel around this country and you look at the sites that were chosen for cities and towns. You know, one of the reasons we have flood problems in this state is because when the settlers decided where to actually build communities, they had to be near water. And so they built on the banks of rivers. Two reasons. One, firstly, you need water to drink. But then secondly, we didn't have highways. We didn't have a rail system. We didn't have planes. All the cargo came by ship, by boat. And so all the strategic towns and cities needed to be on waterways where all the supplies could come and also things could be exported out on the water. But of course now we have a situation where we don't have to have towns and cities on, on, the, on river banks. We need to move them up to higher ground and not have flood problems anymore. But you know, the, this is part of the, the fact that the nation was settled. And I've been to small communities where you might see you know, a few dozen houses, but then you find that there's these, these, these um, tracks through the bush out from these, this little town or village or hamlet or whatever, and people will say, oh yes, you know, the, the blocks of land out there have been marked out since 18 something or other. And all you've got to do actually is go on Google now and you can actually see little tiny hamlets, even, even just out from here, that have all the, the, the design for future development and a lot of it was actually marked out back in the 1800s after the explorers came through and the settlers came behind them. And so town plans were drawn up. And then, of course, people moved in, they built houses, they lived, they worked, and they built community and so on. They settled the place. Now, to settle something doesn't, um, do doesn't sit in, in opposition to pioneering. Because the more they settled, the more effectively they pioneered. Because they had closer bases to work out from. And you know what? We, the, to translate this into um, you know, this next phase for Acts Church, it's about being planted in the house. And, um, and, and about flourishing here where we're planted. And so this doesn't work in opposition to, to pioneering. This is not about getting settled and comfortable and not wanting to know about the big wide world. This is about actually having a greater strength and greater effectiveness for the pioneer, pioneering spirit to take the church forward in God. Amen? It provides a stronger base. That's what it does. Do you know, the more people get planted in this church and flourish where they're planted, the stronger a base this is for the pioneering spirit to be able to impact this community. Amen? Next one. Builders. After settlers come builders. This is a picture of the Story Bridge when they nearly joined it up in the middle, out in the middle of the Brisbane River. So... It looks a whole lot different today. Even those, those cliffs look very different today in Brisbane. But you know, the settlers of Brisbane eventually realised they had to build some stuff. And of course, now in Brisbane, we're building tunnel after tunnel after tunnel. Now, the tunnels amaze me. Do you know that each tunnelling machine costs $40 million? Some tunnels, they buy two. And they start at each end of the tunnel and they work towards each other, when they get to the middle, they can't get them out because the road and everything else has been built behind the tunnelling machine. So the tunnelling machine then tunnels straight down and they bury themselves. $80 million buried. <laughs> Isn't that mind-boggling? But think about what they're doing. These machines not only you know, tunnel out, you know, dig out the tunnel, but all the stuff they're digging out goes out, and as it's going out, there's actually at the back of the tunnelling machine the ability to create the concrete encasement of the tunnel. So the tunnel itself is made as the, at the back as the front is digging the dirt out. Isn't that amazing? Now, we could get all hung up about, well, they buried $80 million worth of equipment. I would rather spend that $80 million in the kingdom. But think about what they're building and the innovation. It's just amazing. But here's the thing. Across our nation, there were great people who've built cities and ports, highways, industries, mines and so on. 
Our nation wouldn't be what it is today without great people who have, at great expense and at great risk, actually built things. True? I mean, look at the, um, um, the opera house in Sydney. Now, we could say, well, hey, you know, they could have built an opera house that was a little more demure, a little more conservative, but why would you? Because it's a landmark to the world. When the satellites go over, guess what they see in Sydney? <laughs> yeah. But somebody had the vision to build that thing. Somebody had the vision to build the Harbour Bridge. And if you, if you go to Sydney, you, you actually want more people to have the vision to build more roads and better roads. <laughs> but you know, after the Second World War, the Snowy Mountain Scheme, now, some of you would not have even heard of the Snowy Mountain Scheme. But the Snowy Mountain Scheme was one of the biggest um, things built in this nation. And it actually caused our economy to be strengthened, but also it provided water for a huge part of, you know, down there in New South Wales and Victoria. And because it's a hydroelectric scheme. But somebody had the vision to build that. And then great people were harnessed to come together to build a great hydroelectric scheme for that part of our nation. Right now, we have a great building project going on, and I'm not being political, called the Australian Broadband Network, and there's been all kinds of stuff in the media about it, but you know what? Somebody had the vision to build something for the future. Regardless of all the other stuff with the ABN, somebody had a vision to build something better for the future. Let's hope it is better, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, you know, there's a pioneering spirit in this house. There's going to be more and more people who are going to settle here and be planted and flourish where they're planted here. But you know what? The future is not just about pioneering and settling. It's also about building. It's about building something for the glory of God. Building ministries. Do you know, I believe God's going to bring in and also raise up people in this house who are going to build ministries that are going to look different from, the, from before. Yeah. Who are going to, God's going to put something in their heart. We can, we can do something in this area. We can touch the community this way. You know, we can disciple people this way. We can train leaders this way. And, and a passion not only for, for innovation, but a passion to build on that innovation, the innovative idea. A passion to actually create and to produce and establish something for the future that maybe hasn't been seen before. But not only that, that um, here, here in this church, there are great people who can build on the foundation that's already been laid. And the foundation's been laid over three decades or more now, a bit over three decades, there's also been a, a foundation of the apostolic that's been laid in the last eight years. But you know what? It now needs builders. People who will build for the glory of God. And some of that is practical. You know, we're, this is our challenge at Agape Church. We need to get a property for the church down there. And so I need builders. Not, as in, not just as in carpenters, but I need people with a building mentality who will say, yes, the pioneering spirit inside me says, yes, we can get a block of land. Or yes, we, we're, it's possible for us to somehow get a building. But then to be able to say, how do we make this work for us? How do we develop this thing? What is that? That's the builder spirit in a church. We want to build something for the future. We want to build something for the next generation. We want to build something for the glory of God. You know, and so it comes down to things like the property maintenance and dealing with the mortgage. But you know, those are the pioneer spirit. They are going to come up with the new ideas. And the builders are going to say, ah, oh, I see that, and this is how we can make it happen. Yeah? And so everything that we're talking about that's made this nation great is in this church to make this church great. Come over the next slide, please. The defenders. Now, I'm not talking about being defensive. <laughs> You know, as Paul and the team said, we're not going into caremaker mode. Um, care, yeah, caremaker mode. All right, caretaker mode, that's the one. All right. But you know, that as you forge forward, you have to defend the gains. Yeah? And of course, I grew up in Papua New Guinea, and um, you know, Papua New Guinea was firstly a, uh, well, yeah, German and also a British colony. Top part was German, bottom part was British. After the First World War, the British took over the whole thing. After the Second World War, they handed it to Australia. 
By 1975, Australia had allowed uh, Papua New Guinea to become independent, an independent nation. But we still are seen by them as the big brother. We still have great influence there. It's part of our sphere of influence, but you know, there, there was a time when it had to be defended in order for our nation to be defended, in order for our way of life to be defended, in order for the, what the pioneers had accomplished and what the settlers had accomplished and what the builders had accomplished to be able to um, not be robbed from us as a nation. And of course, there's the, um, the concept of the Brisbane line that if the, if the Japanese got onto our, our soil, that we would defend all the way down to Brisbane, and that would be it. We would, not go, you know, we would not give away any more. Well, it's pretty hard once they're on your soil to stop them, you know? <laughs> but at least there was a determination that if everything goes wrong, this is where we say no more. And, you know, that's what defenders do. They say, at this point, you will not advance any further. We're holding our ground. And, you know, in Kokoda, and, of course, this photo is the... Um, you know, the, the one that has always encapsulated what the Kokoda battles were about. And, um, but of course, across the Pacific, there were Australian coast watchers. And, and in, in, uh, on an island in the western part of the Solomon Islands, I've actually been to a cliff face where there's a little ledge and a bit of a hollow in the side of the mountain where Australian coast watcher was there for months with a radio until they were either replaced or discovered by the Japanese. But they were essential. They lived a terrible life, a life of isolation and loneliness. Um, you know, they, they had to, uh, uh, if the locals were friendly, then they could get some food sometimes. Otherwise, they would have to try and get um, airdrops at times. Otherwise, they would have to just get into the jungle and try and find stuff to eat. You know, and these guys, what did they do? They put themselves in that position in order to spy on the enemy shipping. Why? As part of the defence of our nation. Incredible. We have customs today, and what are they doing? They're doing the same thing. We have Navy border patrols. What are they doing? They're doing the same thing, as are the Indonesians at the moment. <laughs> it's all good. The borders are very clearly defined at the moment. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be any illegal entries either way at the moment. All right. <laughs> but, you know, when John Howard was Prime Minister, he defended our Australian culture. He defended it in a bunch of ways. He would actually say publicly about, you know, speaking to different things, he would say, that's not our culture. And so some things that were politicised, he would actually make them a cultural issue. And he would point out that some of the lobby groups and other things that were being said and done and whatever at the time were actually damaging what had been built in this nation and, and what had been built needed to be defended. He also did the same thing with political correctness. And I'm so glad he did. Part of Aussie culture is to not be politically correct. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> That's the truth of it, isn't it? You know, if you really love someone, you take the mickey out of them, you know? <laughs> I'll never forget when I was pastoring a church in Melbourne and we had 32 nationalities in the church. My 2IC was Nigerian, his wife was Indian. The pastoral care guy was Irish. The youth pastor was Argentinian, his wife was Italian. So our team really represented what the church looked like. But of course, those of you who know me well, you know that I'm, I've got a pretty bent sense of humour. And one day, I, I, um, it was time for my associate pastor to come up and, I don't know, do offering or communion or something. And I said, Tony, where are you? Smile so I can see you. Because he's Nigerian. <laughs> Well, of course, half the congregation gasped and the other half just broke out laughing. <laughs> and I said, look, I said, we've got to stop, try, stop walking on eggshells around here, you know. This is Australia, for heaven's sake. <laughs> but it was great because that, from that day on, something began to change as far as the interrelating between all the different cultures in the house, you know, because everyone just let their guard down and, and realised that their uniqueness was actually something great that they contributed you know? Amen. But you know, to defend is, there's times to defend. And I liked what John shared about, you know, that, um, you know, one of the things that, that damages unity and, and so on is, is if we're grumbling. And grumbling in the tents is the big one, you know? It's not here on a Sunday, but it's at home and, and so on. But you know, the thing is that what John was talking about was that there are going to be times when 
the pioneers are going to have broken through in some area. The settlers will, have, will be moving in and being planted and, being, and flourishing. And the builders will be building stuff and building up the house of God and so on. And there will be times perhaps when there's a grumbling or, or when there's a misunderstanding or, or something. And you know, as a church family, the need will be to defend the culture of the kingdom in the house. To defend what's been built. To defend what the pioneers have explored and, you know, and opened up for the settlers to move into in the realm of the spirit. Amen? And so to, do, to defend it, it's about continuing to love one another. It's about upholding kingdom values and kingdom culture and the, the unity of, you know, of the spirit and in the bonds of peace and so on. And, um, and great people know how to defend what's been um, taken by the pioneers, established by the settlers, built up by the builders, and they know when there's time to say, well, actually, no, we're standing our ground here. We're standing our ground here because this is for the glory of God. This is not about any person. This is not about uh, any, any agenda. This is about Jesus as the Lord of the church, and we're going to continue to love one another. We're going to uphold Christ-like values and the culture of the kingdom in our church family. And why? Because then things can continue to be built for the glory of God. Amen? All right, last one this morning. Reformers. Reformers are needed. You know, as time goes on, and I'm talking about nation here, there comes times when things need to be reformed. And I remember in the 60s when we went from imperial measurement to metric measurements. And we went from British, well, Australian pounds, which were like British pounds, to dollars. Why? Because it's so much easier to operate with things being a multiple of 10 than 12 inches in a foot. Sixteenths, eighths, quarters, and on it goes. My goodness. I'm glad I wasn't an apprentice carpenter in those years. I, I did my apprenticeship in metric years, and I thank God for the reformers <laughs> who reformed these things in our nation. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? We've, we've had governments reform our ports. We've had reform in our education systems. Now, we may not agree with all the reforms, but I'm trying to point out that change in our nation is, is needed or is desired at times, and it's, and it's because things need to be reformed. Uh, the medical system's been reformed. Now, there's a the name of a lady there, Catherine Helen Spence, and you can see a $5 note there, and that's her picture on the $5 note. Now, this is a relative of mine. Seriously. Not a close relative, but she is a relative. There is a statue in Light Square in Adelaide of her. I've got a photo of my, my uh, standing with my arm around this lady. Well, a statue of her. <laughs> She's not on the $5 note these days because from time to time they, uh, you know, they change the, the, um, the different significant Australians that are on, the, on our currency. But for, for some years, um, her picture was on the $5 note. Why is that? Because she was a reformer. Some people are on our, our, our notes because they are pioneers, explorers and so on. Some are on our notes because they were settlers, did significant things. Some are on our notes because they were builders. Some are on our notes because they were defenders. And some are on our notes because they're reformers. And you know, she was a reformer in two areas, in the education system. She was an educator in South Australia. But her greatest area of reformation in this nation was that she was a suffragette. She was one of the leading women in Australia to fight for women to have the vote. And reformed our political system and our social landscape by giving women the same rights that men had. And she's in my family. But you know what? We need reformers in the kingdom of God. People will say, this has been good, but it's got to change. Or this hasn't been good, so God, how do you want us to change it? How do you want us to reform these things? You know, and again, you know, if we're an apostolic church, well then, what has to be reformed in our thinking or in our methodologies in order to more and more become an authentic apostolic church? More and more an authentic expression of the kingdom. More and more like, a, like the New Testament church. It's about reformation. Why? Because we've had so much history and so much of, of uh, you know, church and religious stuff built into our thinking. And you know what? God's going to raise up reformers more and more in this house. 
You know, the guy you know, who leads the team doesn't necessarily have to be the reformer. Because if it's about New Testament team, I know I'm, I'm messing with some people's heads here today. <laughs> but you know, we all bring different things to the table. So we talk about five-fold team out of Ephesians. I'm, I'm suggesting a five-fold team here today in the church. Pioneers, <laughs> settlers. Don't get hung up on me using that term five-fold, please. Right? But pioneers, settlers, builders, defenders, and reformers. Do you know, maybe God's going to speak about different areas of ministry in the church being reformed. A whole new way of doing, I don't know, ladies' ministry, youth ministry, men's ministry, I don't know. Maybe God's going to talk about, to the, you know, to the uh, team that's leading the church, about reforming leadership as the Holy Spirit reveals different things. I don't know, I'm just throwing things out there. But what I do know is this, there come points in time in every organisation and in nations and even in families where there needs the action of reformers where we say, well, this has been good, but it can be better. Or this hasn't been good, what do we have to do to make it better? <laughs> or this has been fruitful, but w w there's a sense that God's saying something else to us, and it's going to look different, it's, we're going to do things differently, but it's okay. Why? Because reformers are so needed. Because reformers actually change the future. Pioneers will, will, will explore new things. Settlers will provide strength because they will be planted and they'll flourish where they're planted. Builders, they, they will expand and so on. Defenders, they'll be the ones who stand strong you know, when there's difficulties or problems. But then reformers are going to actually make things much more effective and much more efficient and ultimately much more fruitful. And also will be, will, will be um, a key to actually, to this church actually becoming more and more like a New Testament church. Why? Because our thinking even needs to be reformed for us to become a genuine expression of the kingdom of God. Amen? Come on, let's all stand and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great land of Australia. We thank you for our indigenous people and we thank you for the people from every nation of the world that have come here over, over time now to make this a great nation. We thank you for the great people in our nation. But also, Lord, I thank you for this church. And I thank you for those that you have, that have been part of the, the foundations over many years. I thank you also for those that have come from many different places to be planted here. And Lord, I thank you for the strength and the wealth in this house the wealth of people, Lord, and the, the, the leadership, oh God, in this house for the next season. And God, we, we just bless you, Lord, that this house has great people and therefore it is a great church. But God, I pray today, Lord, that you will inspire again the pioneering spirit in hearts. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that um, the, the new people will come and settle and flourish where they've been planted in the house. Oh, Lord, we pray that people will build like never before, that they'll have a mind to work, a heart to build, Lord, for your glory. Lord, to, to build new ministries, to build new things, oh God, and to even deal with the, the practical building things as in maintenance of the building and, and, the, and the, the, uh, the mortgage and other things like that, oh God. Let the builders arise, I pray. And Lord, I pray also for the defenders that there'll be people, oh God, who will stand for righteousness and for integrity with a grace upon their lives, oh God. Lord, that this church may defend Lord, it's, it's culture of the kingdom, O oh God, and that unity might prevail. But also, O oh God, I pray for the reformers. Lord, that I pray that you'll raise people up who will, who, by revelation, have new perspectives that will take this church more and more towards being an authentic expression of New Testament church right here in Caloundra. And so, Lord, we thank you for it, and we give you the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.